Welcome to the Cold Case Christianity Broadcast, the only Christian case-making program hosted by a cold case homicide detective. Jay Warner Wallace has been investigating cold case murders in Los Angeles County for over a decade. His work has been featured on Fox News, Court TV, and Dateline. For more information about Jim's work and the case for Christianity, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. Now, here's your host, Jay Warner Wallace. Welcome back to Cold Case Christianity. I am Jay Warner Wallace. Today we're going to talk about the third letter in an acronym that we have been developing with you to help us prepare to do better as Christian case makers, really just better as Christ followers in our culture. We have been focusing on how to equip ourselves so that we can develop a forensic faith. And this is something we've been doing with young people all the time. And I have a fear, I'll just say this to you. When, when I'm talking about the importance of training for young people, I always fear that the people who are watching who are older, my age, will say that's for young people. No, no, it's not for young people. The reason why I'm focused on young people in the church, young Christians, is not because they happen to be a certain age. It's because I know that that group will grow up into a culture that's even more antagonistic toward the Christian worldview than the one that I'm living in now. So I'm simply preparing the generation that I see that's going to have the greatest challenge. But guess what's going to happen? Don't think for a second that we're not going to be there with them, because we will, we'll be older, but we'll be there too. And, and granted, they're going to be beyond us, but, but, but there's going to be a season in which we're going to be standing right alongside young people, and we're going to be the, probably the folks that they are going to look to for answers. So as I encourage uh, young people and help to train them, I hope I'm also encouraging you because for the most part, the first trainer that your child or your uh, younger associate at work or your younger colleague who happens to be a Christian or the younger person in your congregation, that first person they're probably going to turn to may be you when they ask a simple question. It might be you when they've been sitting watching you for some time to see how you react in the crisis. So I do think that these principles and these, that this need for young people to train is also shared by those of us who are older. Now we talked initially about two, the difference between teaching and training. Teaching is important, but training is far more effective both for ourselves and for young people because training is simply teaching toward a challenge. And it starts with the T for train, T-R-A-I-N. The T is for test. This idea that, that you, you need to test yourself early to see how much you don't know about something before you actually are motivated to, to do any teaching or learning or training anyway. As a matter of fact, uh, we discovered this early on with young officers who fail uh, in the field and find themselves having to struggle to do better. And, and they want to train them once they've failed in the field because they don't want to fail again. It's dangerous to fail when you're a first responder. So testing is an important first step. We've already talked about that. We've also talked about the R, which is raising the bar, requiring more of ourselves. We, we actually have a high bar for a lot of other things in our life, but it seems like we can get a little bit lazy when it comes to the spiritual things. You know, you're, you, you, probably, you might be, for example, more uh, invested and dedicated to your physical training than you are to your spiritual training. You may not miss running as much as you miss your time uh, in devotionals or your time studying or your time sharing what you believe with others. There are some spiritual disciplines that we sometimes uh, get lazy about. Before we get lazy about other disciplines, if it's a discipline related to our job, I bet you we're pretty, pretty steady with that one. But when it comes to this, we sometimes will drop the, the ball a little bit. So we talked about that also. Now we're going to talk about the third letter in the TRAIN acronym. And that is about arming ourselves with the truth. Uh, it's, it's one thing to see what you don't know, and it's another thing to, to want to raise the bar. But at some point, you've actually got to start doing the learning. You've got to start seeing what's out there and studying the other views that are out there. Now, I can tell you that this was important to me as a new officer because I felt like, you know, you would never send an officer into the street unarmed, right? There's danger out there. Uh, we kind of feel the same way as parents of Christians, young Christians. We don't want to send our Christian kids out into the world if it's the university or wherever it may be unarmed. We want them to at least know what truth is and know how to, to, to kind of uh, um, 
uh, behave or uh, wield the truth in, in a d difficult environment. We want our kids to have two pieces, tools and the ability to use the tools, truth and the ability to navigate with the truth in a difficult situation. I, I experienced this. I've got here my, my first Sam Brown I was ever, so it's got more polish on it than it needs to have probably. And uh, this is the first Sam Brown I was ever uh, issued. When I first started, I think I had no space on this belt at all because I was carrying all kinds of tools. I wasn't sure what I was gonna need out there and every one of these uh, compartments would hold a tool. This is, it's got a blue uh, training uh, pistol, by the way, in case you're wondering about that. But each one of these will hold a tool, you know, a baton, a, a mace. So you can hold a taser in a, in a holster. You can hold your handcuffs, your radio, all kinds of tools. Um, and, and when you're not sure what to use, you bring everything. And I felt in those first days, um, kind of working as a young patrol officer, that I, I knew where, I, I had muscle memory in terms of how to get those tools out of that Sam Brown. I didn't have to look, I could do it without looking because I knew I was gonna use those tools and I wanted to be ready with them. Now, it's one thing to give an officer a bunch of tools on a belt, but if he doesn't know how to operate with those tools, they're about useless or even dangerous. So we have two things we have to do in terms of arming ourselves. One, what are the basic tools we're going to need? And two, how do we develop um, uh, and practice with these tools so that we become so good at using them that it's almost like muscle memory? That's what we're gonna talk about in this session. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, I'll show you why this is so important for young people. If you're like me, I bet you sometimes feel bad that you don't share what you believe as a Christian as much as you'd like. Sometimes it's because we're not well equipped. When I ask people why they don't share, uh, they, they, some of these folks have even gone through, some of us have all taken classes in evangelism. I know I did as a new believer. You probably did too. Yet we still don't find ourselves sharing like we should, right? It turns out if you ask people, why don't you share even though you've been trained to do so, it usually comes down to some um, sense of fear that I'm gonna be caught flat footed. I'm not quite sure what I would say if they ask a question. I don't wanna look stupid. I hear these kinds of responses all the time when it comes to why people won't share what they believe as Christians. And I get that. I certainly have been there. That's why it's important for us to begin a process of training to get ready to make the case for what we believe. You'll be surprised at how much it'll help you and encourage you to actually start to make the case. I started by just mastering a simple, um, idea. I believe as a police officer that there are objective, transcendent, moral truths and that these truths are obligations between persons. I think you, you have to have certain justifications before you can do certain things. Where do those ideas come from? Am I the source of those? Well, if that's the case, then if you disagree with me, there's nobody to arbitrate between us. So they, clearly those moral truths can't come from individuals. Do they come from people groups? Well, if that's the case, we can't argue if a different people group has a different set of moral truth claims. No, there's gotta be something bigger than people groups. Is it nations? Well, if that's the case, why would we say that what Germany was doing in World War II was wrong? It can't be wrong. If the nation itself gets to decide if it's right, there's something that even transcends nations. If there's a Star Trek universe, there's something that transcends planets. There are some things you shouldn't do to Klingons or Romulans. I don't think about that for a second. If there's a source of moral law that transcends the entire universe, and if we know that all moral truth claims are actually obligations between persons, who is the objective, transcendent, moral person that is the source of the laws in the universe. Hmm. When I started to think about that and, and kind of practice that in my head, it started to be something I would talk about with my friends who weren't believers. There's a set of disciplines that I can teach you that detectives actually use every day to investigate truth claims and then communicate them to juries that I think will help you be a better evangelist a better Christian case maker, to live a more robust Christian life that'll move you from a blind faith to a forensic faith.
Now, sometimes when I talk about this, about equipping ourselves, about arming ourselves with the truth, this is where it feels like heavy lifting sometimes, right? Now, I've got a small uh, office now uh, behind me. I used to have uh, books all the way from the ceiling to the floor. And um, I started giving those away to students when I would have them come over to my house to train or to get ready for an event that we were going to go, a uh, mission trip or whatever. I would empty out my shelves and just put them all on the floor. And I only would purchase the books that I needed to read right now. Usually I'd get them used. And I only keep that small collection behind me. If I've read it, I will typically give it away, unless it's the kind of reference book that I need to refer to again and again and again. Maybe you're the same way. But I can tell you, you've got to read these books. Why collect them if you're not going to read them? That's, that takes time, right? That's one of those raise the bar issues. Are you willing to invest the time? And then what are you basically investing your time in? Now, I, I realized this pretty early on as a young trainee trying to keep up. I had training officers and during the training sessions, especially the physically demanding training sessions like defensive tactics and other, you know, wrestling or, or whatever the thing was we needed to, to, to do. A lot of this stuff is wears you out physically. And you, you've probably heard it said before, you know, the less you sweat, you, you, you uh, sweat, the more you sweat in here, the less you'll bleed out there. That idea that we're going to sweat hard, we're going to work hard in here. We're going to even go beyond what we think you're going to face. So then when you're out there and you're in the midst of that crisis, it's not not going to be quite as bad. Now, that's hard to replicate, right? And so a lot of times we had um, uh, range masters who would um, set us on treadmills and then we have to run around behind props that we're shooting behind. He's trying to replicate what's going to happen in a real shooting. So uh, this is something we have to do if we're going to be well equipped. I think this is important for us to do for ourselves and we can model this then for other young Christians. If you are the parent of a high schooler right now, you really have two approaches you can take with your high schooler. And I see parents who will ask me this all the time. I even see parents who will come to me before their kids are enrolled in school, elementary school, and kind of start to ponder, what should we do? Should we isolate our kids from the what we think is really not a great uh, system that we're not happy with, our local schools, whatever. Some, some people are delighted with their local schools, great. Uh, our kids kind of did both. We did some homeschooling. We were also in the public school system. So I'm not really advocating for one or the other, but I can tell you that if you think you can isolate your kids and keep them out of harm's way, maybe even you're thinking you want to send them to a Christian university because you're afraid to send them to universities that hold a more hostile, secular worldview. Well, if, if you take that approach and, and you think you're going to be able to isolate your kids, I think you are eventually setting them up for a fall. And we have to do a better job than that. We don't want to isolate. We want to inoculate. Now, I've talked about this a lot in the past, but let me go a little more thoroughly. I'm going to show you an illustration here from uh, um, Forensic Faith that I think hopefully makes it clearer. If you look at this, you'll see you have a couple of choices. One, you could isolate your kids at home. In other words, just kind of behind the safe barrier of your own family and your own worldview, that just keep all the bad ideas away from them, like the shield that has the bad ideas bouncing off of it. But if you do that, they're gonna be completely unprotected, either in university or in the workplace eventually, or as parents raising your grandkids because they haven't really ever engaged the ideas. Now, if you can inoculate them, in other words, give them a dose of the other side's ideas, give them a dose of what's being offered from the new atheists, what's being offered aggressively on the other side, then when they have kind of learned what's wrong with those ideas and have learned that those ideas are false and can be overcome, well, then guess what? You can put them in any environment, the university or whatever, and they don't need that shield. They are the shield because they've already been inoculated against bad ideas. Is. What I mean here is that inoculations for the flu, for example, you give a small dose. It doesn't have to be a, a, a ridiculously small dose when it comes to bad ideas. You can give them the entire breadth of the bad idea, but you do it in a controlled way. The first exposure, I don't want my kids to first hear bad ideas, especially uh, arguments against Christianity or arguments against theism. I don't want them to hear them for the first time at university when I'm not around, or when the first person they're gonna ask is somebody who's not equipped to answer the question. 
I want them to encounter all the claims of the new atheists before they leave my house, before they leave my youth ministry. And we will go through those ideas. I will show them both sides of it. I, I would encourage them. I'm not going to give them um, uh, a straw man view of the other side. I, I, we actually, in our, you'll see on my bookshelves, it's about 50-50. Uh, books from Christians on the same topic sitting alongside of books from atheists. And I want my students and my own family to be able to navigate both sides. Look, we, we sometimes are afraid because we think, oh man, we can't show the other side. We can't show the bad ideas because then they'll hear the truth and then they'll, they will have a hard time keeping them as Christians. What, really? Okay, the Christian worldview is true. That is the truth. Now, if you're concerned that you don't want your young people to hear the objections, it's probably more that you're just not sure how to respond to those objections than it is that they're going to find that that's true. It's not true. The Christianity is true. You, though, and I may not be ready to defend what's true. That's a problem. But it's not that this view isn't true. And so what happens is we sometimes are afraid for our kids to read that view. Because look, if I read Dawkins, if I have my kids read Dawkins, but I haven't read Dawkins first, and I don't know what's wrong with Dawkins thinking in those books, well, really, then I would agree with you. Don't let your kids read Dawkins if you haven't done the heavy lifting first. Look, it's not just going to be... I, I can't. Uh, how many times have I been at a speaking engagement where, where someone has come up to me afterwards wanting to buy a book for a child who has walked away from their faith? thinking that that book is going to solve the problem. That they don't even need to read the book themselves first. Just give the book to somebody. It's all in there. All the answers are in there. You and I both know that we have to master the answers for our own family's sake and for our sake. Look, there is something that's so powerful about arming yourself with good information. It gives you great confidence, right? And it'll help you to navigate going forward. After the break, I'll tell you why I think it's a, it's a character builder. But what I wanted to say before the break is, folks, if you have not started to assemble your collection of the top, it's easy to Google to find them, the top five books written by an atheist in the last 10 years, there's lists of these all over the internet. Go get them. Read them. Let them shake you. Let that be the test. Raise the bar and say to yourself, I am now going to read and see why these claims made by atheists are untrue. Because trust me, for every one of those books, there's 10 that are written by Christians responding to those objections. I have most of the stuff on my own website. And there's lots of websites. Don't need to go to mine. But there's lots of websites out there. As a matter of fact, NRB, the network that you're watching this show on, has some of the greatest apologists on it answering those objections. So I want to encourage you, number one, Equip yourself, arm yourself with the other side's view. Then begin to respond and read those responses. Oh yeah, I know this is a big ask. I know this is really raising the bar because this is going to be time consuming. Well, if you're spending the time to watch this show, you're probably already headed in the right direction anyway. But I'm not asking you to add another 10 hours to your life this week. I'm asking you to reallocate time that you're already wasting somewhere else. It's time for us, if we say we're going to live in a culture and we're going to actually express our Christian worldview in that culture, we're going to be Christ followers in that culture, then it's time for us to accept the responsibility of training ourselves, of actually knowing what we believe and why we believe it. So I want to encourage you to start your library, to put some tools in your Sam Brown. Do you even have a Sam Brown filled with tools? It's time for you to do that. You've got stuff. I know people who've got knickknacks all over their house. They've got their sporting gears all over the. They've got trophies from everything they won since high school stored somewhere in their house. It's time for us to make room for the resources that will make you a stronger Christ follower. When we come back after the break, I want to show you how this will actually do more than change your intellect. It'll change your character. And we'll talk about that right after the break. Several years ago, I was doing a uh, church service at a very large church here in Southern California, and a woman walked up to me afterwards at the book table. 
and wanted to buy a copy of uh, my first book, Cold Case Christianity. And she really wanted it, not for herself, but for her, I think, 26 or 27-year-old daughter. And she said, I'd love to give this book to my daughter. Would you please sign it to her? So tell me a little bit more. She said, well, you know, she's no longer a Christian. She walked away when she was in college. I've heard this story so many times, right? Maybe you're even somebody who's had this story as part of your own narrative, part of your own life. You know somebody, your own kids or your grandkids or your nieces or nephews. I said, okay, I, I can sign this book and give you a copy to give to your daughter, but I'll be honest with you, she's not gonna read it. I know that sounds brutal, but, but you know, if you think about it, when she first started having doubts, you were probably aware of those, right? I mean, she probably would come home and say something that gave you an inclination that she's no longer, or she's starting to doubt her Christian beliefs. And this woman said, yeah, it, it did happen. I remember that. That happened during some breaks, like Easter breaks and things like that. I said, okay, this is the brutal reality of it, okay? It's hard to say, but it's just true. That, that really it was at that point, that moment, when your kids start to voice their doubts that they need to hear somebody make the case for Christianity and it's not Jim Wallace. It's not gonna be probably any of us who write books. It's gonna need to be parents who step in the gap and are able to articulate not just that Christianity is true, but why it's true. The most important apologist your kids are ever gonna know, ever gonna meet, is you. So I said, I'll sign this book, but I want you to go home and I want you to master the material. And I want you to start thinking about your faith differently. I want you to think about it more forensically. Think about it as if you would examine anything. You might spend more time investigating the next car you're gonna buy than whether or not Christianity is true. We need to change that. And then when your daughter comes home for the holiday or whatever, or you see her, you're not gonna hand her my book. You're gonna make the case in your own language, in your own context, given your relationship with your daughter. It'll be five times more powerful. And she did admit that to that point, she never really had thought about these things. See, she had, all this time, she had possessed a blind faith that was in something true and very sincere. A faith that saved her, but it wasn't a forensic faith that she could pass on to her own daughter to inoculate her daughter for the world she was about to face. That's why it's important for all of us to develop a forensic faith. Okay, sometimes I think when um, you watch shows like this or when we start talking about the importance of what we call Christian apologetics or making the case for Christianity and we talk about developing a more reasonable, evidential Christian faith, the whole reason why I wrote this book called Forensic Faith, which by the way is where a lot of this material is coming from, uh, the book Forensic Faith, I think sometimes when we talk about that stuff, it's easy for us to think this is an entirely academic uh, adventure, an entirely academic enterprise, and that somehow at the end of all this, what's going to happen is you're going to be better informed. Well, yeah, you will be better informed. You'll be better equipped. Uh, but here's what I think you'll also be. I think you'll be better uh, engaged, and you'll be have stronger character. Here's what I mean. Uh, I know you've thought about this before, we may have even talked about it on the show, but there's times, you know, when you would go to college or you'd go to class in high school and on the day of a test, they'd have that thing written on the board, test on Friday, test on Friday, and you've been dreading it all week, and then you walk in on a Friday, and there's some knucklehead who's in your class who's actually excited about Friday, and he's like just, you know, he's, like, he's beside himself, and you're thinking, who's excited about the day of a test? Well, I'll tell you why he's excited. You already know why he's excited. He's excited because he's all studied up. He's excited because he's been studying all this whole time. He knows this material. He wants to show you today and demonstrate his proficiency with this material. The people who are most excited on the day of a test are the people who are ready. It's preparation. They are prepared. That's right. The same thing happens to us. The day you think I'm going to go out and share my faith with somebody today, gosh, we shrink from the opportunity. Why? We're not prepared. We're not excited like that guy who's been equipping himself all this time, who shows up on the day of the test and he's like, yep. Yeah, When's that test going to start? Well, why is he that way? Because he's prepared. That's why he's ready to engage the test. If you will prepare yourself, you will be ready and excited to engage the people in your life who you've been walking right by this whole time, who you've been inviting to Thanksgiving dinners and not talking to, who you've been sitting next to on the plane but don't want to open your mouth. These are the times you could get involved. You could be engaged. But what's keeping you from being engaged is your lack of preparation. Well, there's a relationship between preparation and engagement. One more thing. There's also a relationship between preparation and character. There is. All right, the, the, the example I typically use 
is the example of, of chihuahuas in a dog pen. You know, if you have a big yard with dogs, all kinds of dogs, a kennel, and uh, everyone's getting along, but there's a chihuahua in there, that chihuahua's going to be doing what, do you think? Yeah, yapping and yapping and barking and nipping at heels and strutting around trying to make a place for himself. Why? He's the smallest dog, and he's surrounded by bigger dogs, and he has to make a lot of noise to kind of convince them that he's part of this, to convince them he can take care of himself. Yeah, we have a tendency to do that, that fight or flight syndrome, that response we have when we feel like we're the smallest dog in the yard. Meanwhile, a Great Dane walks in that yard and is not concerned about anything. The Great Dane walks in the yard and is like doesn't even flinch because it already knows it's the biggest dog in the yard. It's calm. It's collected. It's confident. Just the opposite of the Chihuahua. Now, I think sometimes we're more like Christian Chihuahuas than we are like Christian Great Danes. Because I think what was happened is we are not convinced that our worldview is the biggest worldview in the yard. When in fact it is. Now, you may not recognize that it is. You may not have known how well it can actually survive when compared to other worldviews. How well it can, it can survive in the, uh, the, 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 the environment, the culture in which we live. You may not have realized it could be defended the way it can be defended. And so, when someone pushes or makes a claim against Christianity, you feel like the Chihuahua instead of the Great Dane. The Great Dane can have all kinds of things thrown his way. <laughs> Whatever. He's still the Great Dane. He's calmer. In other words, his size is contributing in some ways to his character. Hmm. Would that happen for us? I think it would. I think if we recognize, if we knew how to respond to, to anything that could be offered before it's even offered, then trust me, when someone makes an outrageous claim, you're not going to go, well, yeah, well, yeah, you know, well, yeah, well, you, you're, you too. I mean, how many times do you see that kind of thing? Someone makes a claim against us. Well, your world's got this problem. Your worldview's got this other problem. Like, we're not really responding calmly to the objection. We're just trying to show this other, you know, why does that happen? That happens because we're not prepared. And, and we find ourselves doing the Chihuahua thing instead of the Great Dane thing. So I want you, in many ways, and me, to be more prepared for a couple of reasons. Of course, number one, we're going to be more successful in, in defending what we believe in the culture. But we're also going to be more engaged and willing to engage because, like the day of the test, we have been studying and we're ready. And two, we're going to have a calm demeanor, which is the result of confidence. All right, that's it for this week. When we come back next week, we're going to talk about why it's important to get involved and the one thing that really, truly changes teaching into training. We'll do that right here next week at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels and the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity. A homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.